Brothers and sisters, it's great to be with you. One of the energising principles of our fellowship together is that we're no longer singular flotsam and jetsam on, on life's sea. In Jesus we are a body. That's one of the principles. He is the head. We are interlinked, interlocked. We're enmeshed together. Brother Dennis talked about how in his prayer how the image of God has been distorted in mankind and we're called to be different we're called to be um, outriders if you like a foretaste an example of what it might look like if that image is less distorted if it bears not so much that frag frail and fragmented image distorted in Adam but the the um, the glorious light that um, <coughs> emanates from the, the character that is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we are called to be. That's what we're called to look like. So what does that mean in practice? What does that new body in Christ look like? That <coughs> group of believers, that community that is showing to the world a different way of living, which is living in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? And I want to explore answers to that question using some of the verses that uh, we find uh, in, in Paul's letter to the Thessalonians. Um, let's start at the beginning of chapter 2 because I think there's something, there's something strange, certainly when I underline it, about the words um, that uh, he, he begins this, this chapter with. A sense of strangeness. It's the words of someone who... Sounds as if, it sounds as if he's a bit of a defendant, as if he's on trial. He's in the dock. He has clearly been slandered. There are opponents in Thessalonica. And we can infer from his uh, defensive responses the kinds of accusations that he's answering. They're just there beneath the surface of, our, of the text. So, verse 3, this is 1 Thessalonians 2. Our appeal isn't based on false information, the wrong motives, or deception. We're not, we're not here to, uh, conv uh, to convince you by guile. Verse 4. Um, we've been examined and approved by God to be trusted with the good news. And that's exactly how we speak. We aren't trying to please people. Verse 5. We never used flattery. We didn't have greedy mo motives. We didn't have greedy mo motives. We're not after your money. That's not why we're preaching this gospel. We're not covetous. Verse 6. We didn't ask for special treatment from people. We didn't want special praise from anyone. Um, and uh, verse 9. We didn't seek any financial gain when we worked amongst you. You remember, brothers and sisters, our efforts and hard work. We preach God's news to you while we work night and day, so we wouldn't be a burden on any of you. That's the way a, t a defendant talks, The one, that someone who's, as it were, on his, his back foot, trying to convince those to whom he's speaking. But what he did was not out of wrong motives he's been slandered and, and we know the background in, in uh, the, uh, the occasion when he uh, first started preaching in Thessalonica if you just quickly go across to Acts chapter 17 remembering the kind of response that he received when he first uh, preached the gospel there that, that environment of opposition that is, which is clearly there in Thessalonica and no doubt and, and, and I think we can see did not disappear after he left so that's, um, Acts 17 verse 5 the Jews became jealous and brought along the, some, um, some thugs who were hanging out in the marketplace they formed a mob and started a riot in the city they attacked Jason's house intending to bring Paul and Silas before the people there's an uproar there caused by the Jews it doesn't take much imagination to guess that this is continuing to go on behind the scenes in Thessalonica now that Paul has left. And of course their aim is to discredit Paul. But it's not just Paul. And I think this is key. They want to discredit 
him, yes, but his message as well, and the apparent successful work of God among these new Thessalonian believers. The Thessalonian believers had experienced something amazing, something powerful. And if it's real, if it's genuine, then those <coughs> unbelieving Jews are in trouble. So their strategy is clear. They will discredit the messenger. He's a charlatan. He's greedy. He's after your money. He's out for praise. Paul, now back down in Athens, um, hears from Timothy what is happening back in Thessalonica. And so he writes this letter. Not so much, as I would suggest, not so much solely to defend himself, though that's clearly part of it, but to defend the belief in the believers that they truly are called of God, to answer their real concern. Have they really been chosen by him? Is this really God's work am amongst them? Is this experience of God real? Or are the accusations of these Jews outside the ecclesia real? That it's all, uh, it's all um, to, to uh, um, build out Paul's um, sense of, uh, uh, of uh, aggrandizement. He's, he's there. He's, they are his patsy. And so let's look then with that background as to um, ha see how Paul addresses this issue. If you go back into the first chapter, which we read together, and the opening statement, I think, underlines this an analysis that we've given. Verse 4. Brothers and sisters, you are loved by God, and we know that he has chosen you. That, I think, is the main point of these opening chapters, these first two chapters. That was the crucial issue. Can these, these Jews, through their slandering of the believers, achieve their goal of taking the foundation away from, the, uh, from these Thessalonian believers to undermine their conviction that they were chosen by God, that they are among the elect. That's their goal, and on the other hand, Paul's goal is the opposite to establish in, uh, them in their calling and their election. And his argument is tailored to the situation, and that's now what I want to look at, which gives us the insight as to what, a, um, what this body of believers that we are part of, this community of called out ones, should be like. Let's look at how he addresses this point, uh, this problem, this issue. So his first line of argument is a kind of reminder of a fact pattern. He wants to show himself and T Timothy as utterly trustworthy, truthful, and re reliable witnesses of the gospel. And secondly, he wants to remind the Thessalonians that they indeed were changed. That they have experienced such a transformation and that, that they must remember the evidences of God's work in them to, to remind them that they indeed are chosen and saved from their sin and delivered. And you can see those two focuses in these opening verses in chapter 1. So verse 4 reminds them that they've been chosen and then he says, what's the basis for this knowledge? Our gospel came to you not only in word but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction and <clears throat> the evidences are then set out verse 5 you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake so that's the, the first line of his defence look at what kind of men we were and secondly in verse 6 you became imitators of us and of the Lord for you received the word in much affliction with joy inspired by the Holy Spirit in other words what we were and what you became is good evidence that the Holy Spirit is at work good evidence that you are chosen of God don't let the slander of these people call into question what you know is true. Don't be sucked into 
their arguments. And it's at this point that I want to focus now on how then Paul expands on that first of his arguments. Because he is in a sense um, forced, if that's the right word, to say things in these chapters about himself, about the sort of man he was to them and is with all his brothers and sisters that he probably wouldn't have said unless he was under this kind of pressure. And I want to focus on those, this characteristic of the man uh, Paul and what it shows us about this community of believers that we are part of. His description of how he is among them. So, uh, they, it's to be found in those uh, opening verses of 1 Thessalonians 2. And look at what he says in um, verse uh, <coughs> 7 of chapter 2. So we're in chapter 2 now. Um, we were gentle among you. We were gentle among you. Remember what we've established, that one aspect of his argument is, remember what sort of people we became among you. This was evidence that we are not charlatans, as those slandering Jews say. What sort of person is Paul, we should ask? And what he says in these verses is absolutely fundamental and challenging. We were gentle with you like a nursing mother caring for her own children. We were glad to share not only God's good news, not only the gospel with you, but also our very lives because we cared for you so much. The older translations pick up the word, I think it's pneuma spirit, our very souls. We shared our very souls with you. And I want to pick that phrase out almost as the, the, the title if, uh, if you will of what we're challenged to and what we're going to look at. Wherever the gospel flourishes people share their souls. Wherever the gospel flourishes people share their souls. First of all, let's notice how the gospel flourished. We've seen it in a sense already uh, in, uh, back in chapter 1, but, but just remind ourselves, we're talking about a flourishing, a, 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 um, a, a glorious outworking of the power of the gospel. Back to one, the first chapter, verse 5, we know this because our good news didn't come to you just in speech, but also with power and the Holy Spirit and with deep conviction. You know as well as we do what kind of people we were with you we were when we were with you which was for your sake you know what we were like you know what kind of people you became our gospel our gospel flourished at Thessalonica it changed the messenger it changed those who heard the message it changed the hearers that was the evidence that this gospel is real and that God was amongst amongst you the gospel didn't fall on stony soil in Thessalonica powerless it flourished and it flourished and the result that was that Paul and Timothy proved to be certain kind of people amongst them and the Thessalonians their imitators so that's the truth that we see here in chapter when that chapter one when the gospel flourishes people share their own souls so let us questions then about that statement that we've seen here which is true of Paul what is it to share your own soul what does the gospel why does the gospel how does the gospel cause this to happen and then why is it important for us to do this so going back to chapter 2 let's notice first what sharing your own soul is sharing your life is um, he says in verse 8 we were eager to share not only the gospel, but also our own souls. So we can infer from this, when you have shared with someone the most valuable information that you have to share, you have not shared your own soul. Because the gospel is the most valuable thing anybody has to share. But Paul says, I want to share not only the gospel, but 
but my soul with you. So it doesn't mean sharing the gospel or any other information. We as a community are good at sharing information. But Paul is calling us to something more than sharing information with his brothers and sisters. It's a sharing of his own life, his own soul. And it's not just working hard for someone. Perhaps we might infer that from the next verse, verse 9. You remember, brothers and sisters, our efforts and hard work. And surely, yes, hard work is, is part of it. But it's not it at its heart. It's not the, at the heart of Paul's self-giving. Remember, I'm not sure what version you were reading at the outset, but in verse 17, Paul picked out that underlying idea that Paul had of, of leaving them was like being orphaned. Verse 17, brothers and sisters, we were separated from you for a while, physically, but not in our hearts. We were orphaned. That's how he describes the experience. These are not the words of an employee. These are the words of a soul friend. <coughs> when he says, I shared with you my own, own, soul, own soul, he doesn't merely mean I worked hard for you. The giving of his soul, the sharing of his life, was not just information and it wasn't just work. Paul says, I let you see inside of me my soul was there for you to look at. I didn't conceal it. I didn't hide from you what was in me. When you share your own soul, you let a person in to see what is really there. And it's not just sharing information. It's not just working hard for somebody. Where the gospel flourishes, people share their own souls, their joy, their guilt, their fear, their longing and their passion. Uh, what you are, as it were, in the, the, the heart depths of, of your soul. And you can see Paul doing that in the first three chapters of this letter. It's not easy to share your soul in a letter, but I think he does it. We saw already in verse 17, he, 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 there's that great desire to see them. Brothers and sisters, we were separated you from a while, physically but not in our hearts. We made every effort in our desire to see you again face to face the end of the chapter that we had read, verse 20, you are our glory and our joy. Verse 5 of chapter 3, he shares his intolerable burden uh, that, it, that, he, that he bore in Athens, not knowing how they were doing. That's why I sent Timothy to find out about your faithfulness when I couldn't stand it anymore. I was worried that the tempter might have tempted you so that our work would have been a waste of time. Verse 7, He's comforted because of this, brothers and sisters. We were all encouraged in all our distress and trouble through your faithfulness. When he hears about news about them. In verse uh, 10, he shares his deep longing to see them face to face. Night and day, we pray more than ever to see all of you in person and to complete whatever you still need for your faith. Paul lays his soul, his heart, right out on the table for everybody to look at it. His passions, his longings, his thoughts, his fears about what's going on in Thessalonica. We would do well do to ask, have, have I written like that to anybody recently? Do I have someone I can talk to like that, where I don't just share information, where I don't just work hard, so all of that is important, but I share my own soul. How does the gospel cause this to happen? Let's remember our premise, where the gospel flourishes, people share their own soul. How does the, the gospel do it? Well, let's go back to uh, chapter 2 and verse uh, 7 and see what he describes about the change or, or the kind of man he was amongst them. Verse 7. Uh, Although we could have thrown our weight around Christ's apostles, instead we were gentle with you like a nursing mother caring for her own children. The gospel imparts a nurturing spirit to those who believe. Paul gropes for an image for an, uh, a, a picture. What can I use to describe the change that the 
gospel brought about in me and how then I dealt with my brothers in Thessalonica. And what he says is that the gospel made me into a mother of children. And we think about this hard, this hard, tough-minded, um, energetic uh, apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, the greatest theologian, the greatest thinker on matters of um, to do with the gospel of his master the Lord Jesus Christ and he gives us this picture of a mother with her children and what mother has not risen in the night to rock the baby and, and, and has never withheld from that baby anything that it needs what mother has not in the early morning wordlessly shared or unburdened herself at with the child at her breast. This is a remarkable image of the great, tough-minded uh, uh, servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. True gospel gentleness begets a kind of holy intimacy. It inclines the soul to share itself with other believers. I was like a nursing mother caring for her own children we're still ask, answering the question how does the gospel do this well secondly the go where the gospel flourishes it gives people what we, what we might call some sweet affections and kindly feelings toward other believers verse 8 we were glad to share not only God's news with you but also our very lives our very souls because we cared for you so much. We hear from time to time about love being a decision or an act, not a feeling. <coughs> um, so that you can act in a loving way even when you're feeling out of sorts with with someone. Well, that's surely true as far as it, as far as it goes. But it's not all that happens for as I see it in this text when the gospel really flourishes. That's not the ideal. When the gospel flourishes, believers feel affection for one another, one another, and um, and Paul makes that clear that this is not just a, a, a he's not just a particularly emotional kind of person. If we if we look at a couple of other places where when he writes and when Peter writes, we get that same sense that the command is not just to love as a, uh, as a as a as a verb, but but to love as a, a, an emotional uh, reaching out to our brothers and sisters to experience affection so this is in Romans 12 uh, Romans 12 verse 10 you probably know it well but uh, another example of Paul uh, taking us the step beyond just saying well you know you love whatever, however you feel which obviously is true there's, there's no way that that's not true but he takes us a step further love one another with brotherly affection love one another with strong affection so that's taking us beyond just saying well love however you know do the works of love however you particularly feel which which clearly we must do but he's saying the disciples should have a heart for each other not just a dispassionate commitment to good uh, Peter 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 22 love one another earnestly from the heart so it's not enough to say love is a deed love is a decision it doesn't matter how you feel about somebody you love them anyway that's half the gospel it's probably the bottom half the top half is when the gospel flourishes you feel affectionate an earnest desire and uh, maybe an, an analogy to try and bring home this this what I think is a, a, a real challenge is it, that the gospel should have the same effect on us when 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 we kind of face something as tra 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 uh, as uh, a tragedy like death, um, I don't know. Maybe some of you have been sick enough to think that you might be dying. I hope that's not the case. But we can imagine it, can't we? 
for a brother or sister in Christ, when the world starts to pass away before our eyes, what happens, people become precious to us, don't they? The, these kind of grudges that we have, they dissolve. As you lie in your hospital bed, things become extraordinarily precious, like fellow believers, even the awkward ones, the brothers and sisters that were annoying or frustrating or unreliable, somehow in the face of death, these abrasive oddities, these difficulties that made you so mad are in a strange way turned into precious imperfections. That's just the way he is. She was made like that. She can't help it. And you may say, well, we can't live and have that outlook as if we're dying the whole time. But hold on. Everyone who belongs to Jesus Christ has crucified the flesh. That's what Paul tells the Galatians. This means that where the gospel flourishes, death flourishes. In every disciple there, that there is that sense that we are on the brink of eternity. We're in the constant presence of death and resurrection. That's the reality that's changed our minds, our lives. We can see beyond the, um, the, that what, which is in, uh, um, apparent to us, which we're told by Paul is transient, and we can see behind that to the eternal. And we should be looking into people's eyes and seeing that reality. There's a quote from C.S. Lewis, I think, which tries to capture, uh, which captures probably better what I'm saying when he says that um, it's a serious thing uh, to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses. And he's talking about uh, the, the reality of what our brothers and sisters um, have in Christ Jesus uh, been promised. To remember that the dullest, most uninteresting person you talk to may one day be a creature which, if you say it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship. A bit like John worships the angel when he sees someone glorious like that. It is in the light of these overwhelming possibilities, it is with the awe and the circumspection proper to them, that we should conduct all of our dealings with one another, all friendships, all loves, all play. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. That's the reality. It's seeing that, that reality in the, life, in the light of death and resurrection, in the light of this truth. Things that make us angry or irritate us should become so unimportant at the time of death. And the gospel is the time of death, praise God. It's a time of death and resurrection to new allegiances and new affections. So finally we ask ourselves the question, so how, that's how the gospel does it, but why, why is it important? Why is it important that we should be an affectionate ecclesia, not simply work for, another, work for one another, not simply make decisions for one another, but that there would be brotherly affection, uh, affection flowing in our hearts. Well, obviously there are a hundred reasons why that should be the case, but let's just focus on one as we come to take the bread and the wine. We should do this because it is hard. It is hard to endure. The path is narrow. It's hard to hang on in there in life's journey. Marriage, Sunday school teaching, visiting the mission field where the response is meagre. Nothing is easy to hold on to for 10 years, for 20 years, for 30 years, for 40 years. We need camaraderie in this fight of faith. We need to share, as Paul shared with the Thessalonians, the passion of our souls. We need to share gospel gentleness. We need to share gospel affection. We need to share gospel perseverance. Paul said to the Corinthians, imitate me just as I imitate the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in his account to the Thessalonians, he saw something in the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ that drove him to say, I shared my very soul, my very life with you. That's what the gospel did to me. That's why you can see the mark of authenticity in me, Thessalonians. Don't listen to those slandering Jews. The, the Paul that you see was changed. I became a 
nursing mother to you. I became a father. That's something else he says in these chapters. I was affectionately desirous towards you. He cared for them so much. And we see in the bread and the wine that that's exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ did. He cared for us so very much. And we would be as he was. We would be as the Lord Jesus Christ. One who was... Um, <coughs> because when we share our souls when we demonstrate what Paul demonstrated we show that our allegiance is no longer to ourselves; it's through Jesus to our brothers and sisters when you share yourself you give yourself which is what the Lord Jesus Christ did and what we remember he gave of himself to the uttermost he gave his body that his body that is us might flourish no longer flotsam and jetsam on life's sea, but now part of this body with the Lord Jesus Christ at its head. Paul is saying this morning to us, that's what uh, the body that Jesus died for looks like in practice day to day. It's a place where we share our own souls with each other. There's a gospel humility uh, which, uh, which in sharing our souls we give we give great glory to God when we do this uh, with each other and there's a great freedom when we share our souls with each other because a, a sh a sh the sharing with our comrades uh, in the journey gives health to our mind and depth to our fellowship uh, and to our worship where the gospel flourishes people share their souls